I ended up reading The God Delusion on the recommendation of my friend and getting into Dawkins and finding him very persuasive and atheism just looked actually very compelling. God, if he exists, would have to be a very, very, very complicated thing indeed. Well, that is completely mistaken. But then I discovered Christian apologists. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. I am joined by Peter Byram, a drama graduate who got into analytic philosophy and Christian apologetics, ironically through the new atheist movement. He tells his fascinating story in a new book called Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. Peter, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great to be with you, Ruth. Um, I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit strange, if you don't mind. Before we delve into your fascinating story, I hear that you are pretty good at impressions. And I would love you, if you're up for it, to treat us to a rendition of, say, Richard Dawkins and maybe Richard Swinburne. How do you feel about that? Yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, I guess a drama degree was useful for something. Um, <laughs> d- depends on who it is. Um, and let's say I've heard them enough. Well, I mean, I can give you a little tease of one of the things I'm quite eager to talk about, which is when Dawkins and Swinburne had a recent clash. Um, and there were quite a few moments where Dawkins was essentially sort of saying things like, um, uh, how can God possibly be listening to the prayers of 8 billion people simultaneously? That That is not a simple entity. That is a profoundly complicated entity. To which Swinburne has sort of replies by saying, well, no, no, he's not that sort of God at all. He has no extension in space and time. He's ultimately simple. Um, that's a, You can check against the actual footage to see whether that's an accurate impression or not. But um, again, yeah. who needs AI <laughs> when you've got Peter Byram, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we've got that out of the way, um, would you just, I guess, sort of paint a, a picture of, of what it looked like for you in the beginning, you grew up in a Christian home, didn't you? But that's obviously not where you stayed ultimately. That's right. Yeah, I so I I was raised in a Christian home, um, but I do think that the real test of faith in that respect of if you grow up uh, with a Christian faith or with Christian parents or whatever is um, does that faith survive when you move out and do your own things in the world? And in my case. It didn't. Um, when I moved out and went to um, went to my gap year and went to university, the idea of believing in God and Christianity it just sort of it just f- sort of faded away. It kind of faded into sort of irrelevance. It fell into the background. It didn't make sense anymore. Um, and and frankly, I was just preoccupied with other things. Um, and I was hanging around other people with different views as well, um, having a whale of a time at university um, on the drama course. Um, and it just, I just didn't identify with it anymore. Um, it just wasn't, yeah, it wasn't something I had ownership of at all. So what changed? What was the kind of significant factor for you to begin to look into these kind of big questions of life again? Well, this is the funny thing. Around about sort of halfway through university, something happened that involved two of my very best friends at the time. Um, So one of them was an atheist who actually became a Christian. And quite suddenly he had a sort of um, alpha course getting saved experience. Um, And that was really inconvenient at the time because I'd I'd just about forgotten Christianity. I'd I'd sort of, you know, let it drift away. Um, I was saying things that were sort of anti-Christian and mocking Christian. I thought Christians were just these these sort of ignorant, closed-minded people that couldn't handle the complexity of life, and I don't want to be one of those. And then suddenly, this guy is sort of getting saved right in front of my face, you know. Um, so that was that was kind of unsettling. But then if that wasn't enough, another of my best friends, um, he was a bit like me in that he had some sort of Christian background um, when he was younger, but he read... The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins when it was published in 2006, because that's the time that I'm at university. Um, And everything changed for him. You know, he had sort of seen the light. And I remember him saying, this is an amazing book. It's changed everything for me. Belief in God is wrong. Um, And that kind of almost shook me up a bit more than my atheist friend becoming a Christian, because at least with him becoming a Christian, I could kind of go, oh, well, or I maybe he's Maybe he's getting into Christianity, but I've been there, done that. I know that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Trying to forget about it. 
But this idea about this person called Richard Dawkins and these other new atheists, um, the idea of them actually stepping out and saying, we can argue that belief in God is wrong, that really shook me. Because even though I wasn't interested in Christian belief anymore, I hadn't actually considered the idea that you could stand up and say atheism is right or this is the way to go. Um, I was sort of prepared to let live and let live. You believe what you want. I just don't want anything to do with it. But Dawkins was sort of saying, no, truth is at stake. Um, evidence based belief matters here. And faith is belief without evidence. You've got to follow the evidence. So I ended up reading The God Delusion on the recommendation of my friend and getting into Dawkins and finding him very persuasive. And atheism just looked actually very compelling once I was um, sort of triggered to consider it consciously as an option. It's really interesting that you say that it was the, like the deconversion of the one friend that had more of an impact than the conversion of the other. Um, and you actually say in Coming to Faith Through Dawkins, even though I had no interest in anything God related, I'd adopted a relativistic stance on the matter. But I guess you, you were fairly apathetic about religion, but, but you wanted to read the book. Was that purely because of the recommendation of your friend that you wanted to read the book then? Yeah, I think so. It just seems sort of novel and interesting and almost maybe even revolutionary. Um, this idea that, um, you know, I, I, I don't have to just sort of um, settle for ignoring or not being interested in Christian stuff. But actually, um, you could really knock it down and show it is wrong, it is irrational and dangerous. So um, it almost seemed like an opportunity to totally and utterly settle the matter as well. Um, so that that was the there was intrigue there um, that sort of led me to look into it and read the book. And so obviously, you then read this book, The God Delusion. What were some of the reasons that Dawkins gave for not believing in God? And I guess were there any arguments that you particularly resonated with that you hadn't heard before that you were you know that you that kind of struck you was there anything in particular in here that was like the knockdown argument that you'd kind of been waiting for for Christianity I think um well on one level there was his general principle about he defined faith as meaning believing something without evidence or against evidence um and that was quite sort of mind-blowing to actually think about because it made me question, good grief, how many things in my life do I or have I been believing without evidence? You know, maybe in that time when I was younger and might have had more of a sort of loose, whatever you call teenage faith or whatever, maybe I was being delusional and I was believing without evidence. Well, no more of that. I'm going to demand evidence. Um, so that principle itself just seemed very compelling. You know, I don't want to go anywhere near anything that you know, doesn't have evidence for it. But then also, um, Dawkins, the interesting thing about Dawkins was he didn't just try to knock down belief in God. He actually tried to argue against the existence of God. He actually went further. And he there's a whole chapter in the book about why God almost certainly does not exist. Um, and he basically, he, he tries to turn um, an argument for God on its head, essentially. Um, I get the impression Dawkins has been used to hearing people, sort of people who believe in God or maybe even creationists or people like that. Um, there's a sort of analogy that they that is used sometimes where somebody says, um, look at the amazing complexity of the universe and the appearance of design in the universe. This is, you know, incredible and it's really improbable. How can you believe that all of this intricate um all this this amazing um, detail of the universe came about by accident without a designer. That would be like believing um, that a tornado could blow through a junkyard and all the pieces that get blown around in the tornado just happen to perfectly assemble into a Boeing 747 airplane. Now, if you think that's unlikely, you'd better think that the universe um, being the product of an accident is unlikely. You should believe the universe is designed. Um, now, I think I get the sense that Dawkins has heard that a lot, and it probably irritated him quite a lot, because in his mind, that's a false dichotomy. Um, he sees that as a false dichotomy between um, things that are either designed or the product of a random accident. And his life's work basically is to argue, no, 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 hang on a minute. There is a third way. There's a third option here. Things can look really complex and really improbable appearances of design, whether you're talking about the human eye or the wing of a bird or 
um, or, or even just uh, on, you know molecular levels or even the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life, whatever it is, Dawkins' main argument is that um, the appearance of design, of improbable design, can come about through gradual probable steps. He calls it climbing mountain probable, where you start um, with very small steps where gradually and gradually you slowly and plausibly build up to the what would otherwise be the highly improbable result. So that was a really fresh way of looking at things, that maybe everything around us is the product of a, of a natural, gradual process. But he goes further um, and tries to turn that whole Boeing 747 thing on its head. Um, and he actually, one of the names that he gives the central argument in his book is the Boeing 747 Gambit, the ultimate Boeing 747 Gambit. And what he does is he tries to turn the tables by saying, look, guys, if you're going to come along and say that the appearance of design in the universe is so improbable, it needs a designer. Otherwise, it's as crazy as that tornado making the airplane. You've got an even bigger problem because whoever designed this universe would have to be even more complex than the universe in order to be capable of designing it. And so you guys are stuck with a really complex thing that needs explaining. You guys have the ultimate Boeing 747 assembly by random um, chance problem. So that whole argument was really interesting. And, and he the, the way that he flipped it around, um, and it was very persuasive on first reading. And so I guess in some senses, Richard Dawkins was like your first foray into new atheists, but you then encountered other new atheists. And, uh, and what did you find compelling about new atheism? Um, well, I think it was that they did seem to be very intellectually credible. Rhetorically, they were really engaging as well. And compared to a lot of the religious people I saw them debating, you know, on YouTube or wherever, they just seemed to be winning. They were just doing better. And was it just a sort of purely intellectual thing that was drawing you towards atheism? Or do you think there was something that resonated kind of emotionally and, and from a heart perspective, given your background in Christianity as well? Yeah, I think, um, well, the emotional dimension as well was that I was coming to identify Christianity with simplistic, bigoted, close-minded people, the kind of um, uh, people that, you know, might um, might protest or close down plays, for example, because they, because they think it's blasphemous and offensive, um, or just fundamentalists, um, you know. So um, Christianity looked unattractive as well. Um, and so, so really, they're just the atheism looked more attractive too and also you know i think there was an element as well of well hey look i'm i'm out here now on my own making my own way um what isn't it great that there isn't a cosmic authority i can sort of set my own path now as well so you know there was that as Quite well convenient <sighs> yeah yeah it, it, it was it, there was a sense of convenience about it so i think it was both those parts were attractive but also the new atheists did seem to have an intellectual edge at the same time and in your own words, you you began to obsessively engage with with some of this stuff. I mean, that's quite a change from the apathy that you described at the beginning, that kind of relativistic, relativistic stance of like, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. So where did that change occur of this kind of apathy to suddenly like actually truth is at stake, as you say that, you know, Dawkins expounds in his book? Where did this kind of obsessive needing to to read more and watch more? Where did you know where did that shift come? Or was it was it a gradual change? Well, I think I just sort of got hooked into it. But also, well, being a student in two thousand and six, and YouTube has just been invented. It is a great way to procrastinate from essays as well. Um, so but no, I, I think it, it just it just intrigued me because I, I wanted to watch more. I watched more debates. I watched more Dawkins. I watched Hitchens. Um, and so um, just the just the, the drama of the debate, but but also some, you know, some of the questions were there were questions that were being raised and um, some questions were not quite being settled, maybe as well as others. Um, but also um, there was there was a sense as well of if I go looking for this evidence or demanding this evidence, you know, it'll be really clear that no religious people or Christians or theists will be able to provide it. And I can be even more secure in my rejection of God. Um, because I will have sort of, in a way, put it to that test and seen how badly all the religious advocates fail and how Dawkins was right about there being no evidence for it. 
So at this point, you're a huge proponent of new atheism, big fan, you know, reading as much as you can, watching lots of videos. When did your dissatisfaction with some of this new atheism, the new atheists themselves, when did that start to emerge? And, and was there something in particular that kickstarted that dissatisfaction? Mm. Well, I can probably show you actually, because um, the, the 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 very one of the very clips that actually sort of started challenging my thinking, um, I've I've got with me. Um, it was basically when so. To start with, I, I watched Dawkins and Hitchens and others debating religious people who did really badly. They were just cringeworthy. But then I discovered Christian apologists. Um, I actually discovered Christian academics who were much more prepared um, to engage and actually offer rational argument and evidence of the kind that Dawkins was asking for. So I saw Dawkins debate John Lennox, for example. That was my first exposure um, to you know that kind of... Um, debate and conversation where it seemed as though there was something more substantive there. There was a little bit more challenge coming from the Christian side. But the the big one really was when I discovered William Lane Craig. Um, because of course, uh, he had videos, not that he's ever, he's never uploaded a YouTube video in his life. This is all sorts of other people doing it. But there were videos of him on YouTube um, debating atheists and the atheists were actually really struggling. Um, William Lane Craig was presenting what seemed like quite formidable arguments, or at least arguments that needed a lot more thought. Um, and um, and he was, there were talks and lectures as well. Um, and he was actually challenging, among lots of other things, um, Dawkins' central argument from the God delusion. Now, William Lane Craig was presenting arguments and evidence for the Christian faith as well. Um Things like um, various forms of the cosmological argument, um, like the Kalam cosmological argument. So reasons why the fact that the universe um, had a had a beginning in the finite past, um, reasons why that is evidence for a transcendent um, cause, a transcendent creator of the universe. Um, arguments from design based on that fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Moral arguments about what best accounts for moral truths. And even historical evidence for the resurrection. He was he was unpacking that stuff, and that was interesting in its own right. But he was also responding to Dawkins. Um, so what I can actually do, um, I've got a little clip that's a good example of the kind of argument Dawkins was giving, and then I can follow that with a clip of how William Lane Craig, in a separate video, was responding to it, um, and that might give you a good sense of um, of, of what it was like. So. Uh, to begin with, um, this is Dawkins kind of in summary, um, giving what he considers his devastating, those are his words, devastating argument about why, no matter what the alternative explanations are, God is always the worst explanation. And when is this, PB, just to give us a bit of context in, in terms of when yeah. he's saying these things? Yeah. So this one is from 2006. So this is right at the beginning of my journey, right at the beginning of Dawkins um, going on this whole venture himself. So here we are. It's a short one here where he just, he summarizes the position. However difficult those simple beginnings may be to accept, they are a whole lot easier to accept than complicated beginnings. Complicated things come into the universe late as a consequence of slow, gradual, incremental steps. God, if he exists, would have to be a very, very, very complicated thing indeed. So to postulate a God as the beginning of the universe, as the answer to the riddle of the first cause, is to shoot yourself in the conceptual foot because you are immediately postulating something far, far more complicated than that which you are trying to explain. So that's sort of in a nutshell what Dawkins thinks is the devastating argument against God. It, it's, it's, it's a slightly more sophisticated version of the, well, who made God then? Who designed the designer objection? It's just that Dawkins is putting his evolutionary spin on it um, to make the issue about complexity. God has to be really complex. Now, this is a really good example 
um, from the next year. I think this was uploaded in about 2007. Now, this is William Lane Craig responding to the God delusion, um, that argument. Now, he pokes a lot of um, holes in it, but this is one that I think really stands out on the um, on the complexity um, point of view. And this is something you encountered when you saw it around 2007. That's right. Yes, this was um, one of a number of things that William Lane Craig was doing. Um, in this case, it's a sort of interview to camera, but there were other things that he was arguing in debates or public lectures as well. Um, and this is the way he respond. He responds, and this is one of the things that I saw at the time um, responding to that argument in the God delusion. Now, Dawkins goes on to defend the idea that a designer wouldn't be a good explanation because, he says, the hypothesis of a divine designer is more complex than the world that you're trying to explain. Uh, an explanation has to be simpler than the phenomenon you're trying to explain, and he thinks a divine designer is less simple than the world, the universe involving all this complexity. Well, that is completely mistaken. When you reflect on the idea that God is an immaterial entity, a spirit, um, he, he is a mind without a body, then God is a remarkably simple entity because he has no parts. There's no composition in God's being. An unembodied mind is an entity that is startlingly simple in its nature. Um, so what Dawkins is obviously confused is a mind's ideas, which may be very complex, with a mind itself, which is a very simple entity. So insofar as you're interested in simplicity, the hypothesis of a divine designer is certainly an advance in simplicity, for what it's worth, over the unexplained, contingent complexity of the universe with all its diversity and variations. So I think that Dawkins' central argument is just hopeless. It is logically invalid on the face of it, and moreover, it's predicated upon premises that I think are clearly false. So, so that that's really interesting because um, that and the, what William Lane Craig was essentially saying, and William Lane Craig concludes this in his main argument for the existence of God, that God is a God is not a like a sort of, it seems as though basically Dawkins is conceiving of God as if God were just a sort of gigantic, extra large version of a physical creature. Um, but actually, the whole point of God is that he, as William Lane Craig has said, God is an unembodied mind. He is an immaterial being, because the whole point of God is that he invented the material universe in the first place. And so God isn't going to be made up of bits and pieces of component physical parts. Um, and if he's not made of bits and pieces like that, well, then you can't assign any improbabilities because you're not you're not trying to assemble God like a like a like a like an Ikea kit or a bit of furniture or something like that. Um, it, it, there is no materiality to God. So that was fascinating because it just looked as though Dawkins' argument completely fails to even engage with what God is. And if that wasn't enough, um, because I got more drawn into this, not just watching William Lane Craig, I, I read books of people critiquing Dawkins. Um, now, in, in, the, in the book, um, I quote actually an atheist philosopher that I was reading around about that time, maybe 2008, 2009. This is the atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel, and he makes exactly the same point that William Lane Craig makes. So he's got no axe to grind theologically here. But um, when Thomas Nagel got hold of Dawkins' argument, he, he said this about it. And so just contrast this with what Dawkins says. This is Thomas Nagel. So he says, God, whatever he may be, is not a complex physical inhabitant of the natural world. The explanation of his existence as a chance concatenation of atoms is not a possibility for which we must find an alternative, because that is not what anybody means by God. If the God hypothesis makes sense at all, it offers a different kind of explanation from those of physical science, purpose or intention of a mind without a body, capable, nevertheless, of creating and forming the entire physical world. The point of the hypothesis 
is to claim that not all explanation is physical and that there is a mental, purposive, or intentional explanation more fundamental than the basic laws of physics because it explains even them. That's the atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel criticizing the God delusion when it was published. So there are all there were all these issues coming up about Dawkins seems to be treating God like a physical creature, like a material creature. Dawkins is confusing the composition of God with the capabilities of God. And it just seemed as though there was a lot of stuff that Dawkins needed to engage with here. Before we get into some more of your sort of, you know, the, the arguments beginning to crumble and you beginning to get slightly disillusioned with new atheism, what was it about William Lane Craig? Like, obviously, we've seen an example of one specific argument there that he's knocking down. But what was it about William Lane Craig that you were so drawn to in these debates? Because obviously, ironically, you came to him via the new atheists. But what was it? when you saw him that was so compelling for you? Well, I think it was how he seemed to be giving exactly what Dawkins was demanding. Dawkins has said, you've got to go out there and look for evidence, you know, reason, logic, evidence, and be prepared to form your beliefs on the basis of that. And William Lane Craig, it, there, there, there was no kind of silly, fluffy, vague religious language with him. Um, he was coming at it from a very rigorous, logical approach. You know, he is a philosopher. Um, and so, you know, he would outline his arguments very clearly, um, formally. So his most famous um, version of the Kalam cosmological argument, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And then Craig would then have to give reasons for why those premises are more um, plausible than not. You know, he'd have to give the evidence that supports the premises and show how they lead to the conclusion, and then why that cause would have to be the unembodied mind we've just been talking about, and it couldn't be the physical creature that Dawkins has misconceived God as, uh, as being. But really, it was a there, there was a very calm, uh, collected and transparent and even vulnerable approach in what William Lane Craig was doing. Because if you make your arguments so um, so transparent, you know, to be able to see all the premises, then somebody can come along and point at a premise and say, right, this one is wrong and here are the reasons why. So it's stripped away um, sort of rhetoric um, and emotional manipulation. And it just seemed as though he was offering the kind of stuff Dawkins was demanding. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. For more shows, resources, and our newsletter, visit premierunbelievable.com.